I'm really excited to be able to finally make this video because it means I finished the first version of my Godot game template. This base project lets you skip over the boring boilerplate code and get right to the fun part, making your game. It's not feature rich yet, but surprisingly with very little code, it already saves me a ton of time. Here's the plan. I'll be regularly pushing updates to the template, then we'll make a small game with it, and we'll carry new features and improvements back into the template. Rinse, repeat. As always, code for the template and the games we make will be made available to you, so if that sounds interesting, now would be a great time to thwomp that subscribe button so you don't miss out. At the end of this video, we'll take a look at the feature roadmap, but in the spirit of getting right to the fun part, let's take a look at what the game template does as of today. If I launch this template project, you'll see there's a start screen, there's a settings menu, a quit button, more than enough to get started with any game, jump right into a game jam. The first feature we're gonna look at is the settings menu, which auto-generates a player preferences file that stores two independent volumes for your music and sound effect buses. It's got this drop down, which isn't wired to anything, but if you've got a localization system, you can enter them here and connect up to that. And this menu is really easy to add features to. So if you have checkboxes, other settings like say a screen resolution dropdown, which I have planned for the next version of this, those can all be very easily added right here. Let's take a real quick look at how that settings menu is constructed. So it's set up as a canvas layer so that you can call it up at any time and just throw it up top of the game, the start screen, wherever, and make those changes. And the thing I like most about the way the settings menu is constructed, if I scroll down here to our listeners, most of those are uh, on change listeners. If I select the music slider, for example, you'll see we're listening, we're connecting to the value changed listener. As the value changes, we're storing it in the appropriate property of our user preferences file. And we do that with the music slider, with the sound effects slider, we're doing it with the drop down. We could, we could do it with the check boxes or any other things we add to the setting menu. And then down in this notification handler, we're listening for exit tree to call save on our user preferences so that we don't have to do that inside of every single event handler. You can see we're also using this notification to pause and unpause our game anytime this settings menu is presented, which I think is pretty handy. And then looking at how this user preferences file is actually created, I'm gonna go over into our auto loads. This template right now has two auto loads. Let me open that up. First is this globals, which has some of our save files in it. And then the scene manager, which some of you might know from other videos. We'll talk about that in a second. But our globals file sets up our audio buses, creates a user preferences file, which is what we just looked at. And it's calling this load or create, which I'm gonna jump into. This is a pattern I use a lot. It'll look for whether a file exists. And if it does, it will load that file. And if the file doesn't exist, meaning the person playing this game has never opened it before, it will create a new one. And that way you don't have to worry about externally checking for whether something exists. You just say, hey, give me the save file. And if there is one, you get it. And if there isn't one, it creates it. And then it gives you that. It's very handy. Um, going back to our globals, we're doing the same thing with the user save data, which is separate from the preferences that has to do with saving the actual progress of the game. This is more settings of the game. We'll come back to this in a second. So that's our setting menu out of the box. Um, if you change nothing and you just stick to assigning sound effects that you call to the sound effects bus and playing music in the music bus. Oops, I did not mean to press start. Although you got to see one of the uh, transitions that's built into the scene manager, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, out of the box, it's automatically saving all of this because of what we just looked at. So if I pull the music all the way down and the sound effects somewhere in the middle and change this to Spanish and close and reopen, if I go into my settings, you'll see Spanish, half volume, no volume, simple. So now that we've discussed the way user prefs are created and saved, let's take a look at the save system, which in this version is using JSON files. 
Uh, there are certainly other options. There are pros and cons to both. But because I want this to be a very iterative process, I built one simple JSON loader that we're going to extend and we're going to use that in the first game that we make with this game template. And then in future versions, if we need something JSON can't or shouldn't do, we'll implement the resource saver and we'll talk about it in future videos. So let's look at the JSON loader file. This class is specifically for reading, writing, and creating files. That's it. It's not supposed to do anything specific for your game. So you give it a save path for where you want to put the user save file, and you give it a path to the default structure. It will use whatever's in this JSON file to create the first save, which again, just like we did with the player prefs, is using this load or create method. If it exists, it's gonna read what's there, and if it doesn't, it's going to create a save file from this default file, which looks like this. The first game I'm gonna create is gonna be a very simple puzzle game, probably. Um, and, and all it's got is a dictionary that stores a zero if a level is locked, a one if a level is unlocked, and a two if the level is completed. So if we go back into this JSON loader file, all it does is manage accessing and writing to that save file. For your game, I've included a sample implementation, this save data, which extends JSON loader, meaning it inherits all of the ability to read, write, and create, but then adds helper functions that are specific to the data that you're storing. Now what's in here isn't technically part of the base project. This is sample code that might be used for a very specific level base game like I was just talking about. The reason I do it this way is it effectively acts like an API between the logic of your game and the structure of your save file. So you could access your data directly to read and write it from your game. It's sitting as a property on this global file. So you can call globals.save.data and get direct access to your JSON file once it's been parsed. The reason I don't like doing it is, let's just say, for example, partway through development, we decide that the structure of our save file needs to change. This is very common. If we've been accessing globals.save.data all over our game, the path to that level progress is going to need to be replaced throughout the entire game. And yeah, there's a find and replace function, but that can get kind of messy and I've had stability issues with it. But on top of that, if you create an API-like structure through which everything accesses that data, one, you have the ability to, to check globally whether the things you're trying to access exist before accessing it. And then you can also do some data validation. So right here, I've defined that 0, 1, and 2 I was talking about earlier. This is uh, locked, unlocked, and completed. If I'm trying to assign some other value that we don't recognize, I can push an error. I can do data validation. I can do error checking. But also, when my data structure changes, I can make a simple change here and here and then everywhere else in my code where I'm reading or writing that data, this hasn't changed. I'm still accessing it through this save data class, this like API. So that that's the operating theory right now is JSON loader base class that handles just the reading, the writing, and the creating, extend that class to build in the helper functions and all of the other logic that you need specifically for your game the other big feature and other auto load is my scene manager class, which I've done a couple of videos on linked below. And for those of you new to this, it's a class that manages loading scenes, displaying loading progress, transitioning through the between those scenes. Um, and then it also has a protocol for passing data between scenes. The version of the scene manager that's included in this 0.1 of the game template is 
a slightly newer version than what I discussed in the last scene manager video. Everything works the same. I've rebuilt the transitions in the animation player so that they scale better if you change the size of your game window, which I'm sure many of you will. Moving forward, I will continue to make updates to the scene manager, but I don't think I'm going to make them in the standalone versions that I have up on itch and GitHub. I'm going to make them exclusively inside of this game template. It's just easier to manage that in one place. And I think with this being field tested over and over again, this is just the more logical place to continue maintaining the scene manager. So if we go over to our start screen, you can get a look at the scene manager in action. We're calling scene manager dot swap scenes. We're looking up our scene in our scene registry. I'll show you that in a second. This is where we want to put the new scene. This is the scene we want to remove self, meaning get rid of the start screen, replace it with this first level and then use this wipe transition. So if I play this and hit start, we get the wipe transition. There's my stupid placeholder level. It's not a Godot game without the Godot placeholder logo somewhere. But if I use a fade to black and run this again, we'll get a fade transition instead of a wipe transition. That's just a 10 second demo of what the scene manager does. Like I said, there are videos on that below and the source code for that individually is available on itch and GitHub, but the game template is gonna be the better place to get that moving forward. This scene registry, I, I wouldn't call it a feature. It's a little thing I'm testing out. You can see that in the note I've left for myself. Again, I don't really like using find and replace, and I generally like changing things in one place wherever possible. So the theory here is, let's say I'm making a you know level-based puzzle game. So maybe I've got 100 levels. The order of those might change, the names of those might change over time, and I don't wanna keep finding and replacing that all over the place and you know maybe I refactor and put everything in a new folder I would rather change that here in this you know static constant and then reference the paths through this dictionary so I, I you know the theory is the levels go here the main screens like the game over screen the you know maybe there's a pause screen I don't know those would go here and Again, we'll field test this and maybe I might decide there's a better way to do it. Maybe I might find that this is fine, but needs some extra features. Iterate, make a game, reiterate. I don't think that's how that word is used regardless. So that's basically all the features of 0.1. Uh, I know it probably doesn't seem earth shattering, but it does provide all the wrapper functionality that you need to make a lot of games and leave you to make just the game itself. Everything beyond customizing the look of the menus that you've seen here, which are intentionally generic, everything else is literally just the game logic and you stuff it into this thing and you can throw it up on itch. You can, you know, package it up for steam. To wrap things up, let's take a look at some of the features I've got planned. This of course will change as we iterate and as you provide feedback, but here are a few of the things that I've jotted down. In the near term, I'd like to add some small features like a white labeled modal for creating are you sure prompts. I'd like to build in some UI themes to make customizing the template easier. I'd like to pre-build some things like level select screens and some stock player controllers for different types of games. And then farther down the line, some other things I'd like to add include moving my dialogue and localization systems from other projects into this template, building a more robust audio manager, building a Steam API wrapper, UI and code support for creating multiple save files and deleting them, building in a full and window mode toggle with screen resolution settings, which Frankly, I should probably be up here. And of course, please comment down below if there are features you'd like me to add or clarify better in future videos. I'm really excited to get started working with this. It's been a long time since I've made games for myself, and this is the foundation that's going to allow me to do it. And I hope it also gets you started in your projects more quickly as well. Thank you so much for watching. You can find source code for this on GitHub and Itch, which will be linked down below. And if you've made it this far, that's gotta be worthy of a subscribe. As always, I appreciate you spending your time with me. Please be kind to yourself, be kind to others, and I will see you in the next video.